Our gracious Lord and Savior, we are so privileged to be able to come before you once again to learn of you. Thank you, Father, for the privilege, Lord, of having you as our God. Thank you, Father, for giving us your spirit, our trusted teacher. Bible says that because we have the unction of the Holy One, we did not need for any man to teach us. And so, Lord, we thank you because we, 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 within us is resident, Lord, a teacher, the one who can reveal to us all truth concerning you, concerning Christ. And so tonight, Lord, we come, Lord, to, to the Holy Spirit, our trusted teacher. We come, Lord, with an attitude of desire, with a sense of expectation, Lord, to receive of you. Holy Spirit divine, begin to reveal to us the deep things of God, those treasures that are hidden uh, beneath the surface. Unfold them to us, unravel to us the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven in the mighty name of Jesus. Take of Jesus and show it to us in Jesus' name. The Bible says, when wisdom, uh, uh, the Bible says, my son, he thou only because it is good and the only come which is sweet to your taste. Say, so shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto you. Say, when thou hast found it, then there shall be a reward and your expectation will not be cut off. Lord, we all have expectation tonight. Our expectation, Lord, is to meet with you. Therefore, Father, cause us to find that word, the truth of scriptures, that principle, that instruction, Lord, that will deliver our expectation in Jesus' name. Lord, cause our soul to be sat, 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 satisfied with the fatness of your word in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you. We give you glory. We worship you. We adore you. Help us to find rest to our soul. Help us to find assurance, hope, peace, comfort, and encouragement in scriptures. Lord, we give you glory. We give you praise. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. It's always a joy and privilege to come before uh, the Lord to study his word. And uh, the Lord has been helping us so far. We've embarked on this journey, studying this very wonderful book, the book of Matthew. You. And uh, tonight we we'll want to continue hearing as we continue Matthew chapter 18, which we started, uh, which I touched on briefly uh, about a week ago. Matthew Gospel, and I want us to please uh, read with me. And by way of a very brief recap, I will just read the verse, uh, the first nine verses, which I, we've already covered during the previous uh, study. Matthew chapter 18, uh, verses one to nine, just as a way of recapping uh, the, the things that we learned. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and be become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child, in my name receiveth me, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, to a better for him that a milestone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the death of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, 
for it must needs be that offenses come. For woe unto that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life or to maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if then I offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into her fire. Take it therefore that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven the angels do always behold the face of my father. So part of the truths that uh, we covered last week uh, from these first 10 verses was the fact that uh, without conversion, there is no entrance into the kingdom of God. Um, we also emphasize the fact that childlike humility is the basis for kingdom greatness. Here, yeah, there was an ambition in the heart of the disciples who is going to be the greatest in God's kingdom. They were ambitious. And the Lord picked and picked a little child, set it in the midst of them, and said, Look, we've got to be like this child. In other words, the lower you, you become, the higher you go in the kingdom. You know, the lower you be, the, the lower you, you stoop, the lower you stoop, the higher you go. You've got to be like a child, even though you're an adult, you've got to be like a child. And then your greatness. Will be, will be released in the kingdom. Kingdom greatness requires simplicity of a child. It requires the innocence of a child. It requires the unquestioning acceptance and yield deadness of a child. We talked about that the last time. Then the Lord also talked uh, to us about the sin of stumbling, uh, stumbling blood. How by one man's action, the faith of another brother, another sister, you know, can be affected such that they stumble in their walk of faith. Uh, that's the sin of the Sunday book. And uh, the Lord gave us an assurance that offenses will abound. In other words, you cannot rule out offenses happening. You can't rule out people causing others to stumble. You know, but it places a judgment. They will unto the person who causes offense. So what you and I can do and aspire to do is that won't be the curse of another brother's uh, fall. We will not trip up another bro Christian brother, another Christian sister. That's all we can desire and pray for. But that there won't be, you know, offenses or people tripping up, you know, another within Christendom. We cannot pray that away. And then the Lord also gives us, you know, a very hyperbolic uh, statement that it does not in any way expect us to take literally when he says things that are close to our heart, that we cherish, that we treasure, that we hold there. You know, no matter how close to our heart they are, no matter how much we treasure them, if there are things that will cause us to stumble, if there are things that can cause us to derail in our Christian world, if there are things that can cause our faith to waver and to shake, that we have to really seriously deal with those things and take them off and take them out. And he was saying that, look, they might as close to us as our eyes, we need to pluck them out. Those things might be as close to us as uh, even, you know, maybe our hands. We need to cut them, you know. Uh, it's not a literal cutting of, you know, hands and legs and plucking out of eyes. But it's saying those things which are very close. So they might be relationships, whatever they are, you know, they might be habits, they might be things, you know, around, hanging around our destinies, you know, that might want to shipwreck our faith, that they need to be dealt with decisively. Um, another way I would put that is that, um, you know, uh, if, if uh, any sin that is not dealt with will eventually destroy, you know, I think that's what the Lord is also trying to say, you know, sin will eventually destroy, it will eventually lead to hell. So uh, behavior that is uh, uh, permitted, you know, it is the behavior that cannot be corrected, cannot be changed. And it is in that sense that We'll have to trust the Lord to deal with our uh, whatever aspect of our life that uh, is not in accordance with the word of God. So we want to continue today, really, from uh, verses, uh, I'll start reading from verse 11, actually, Matthew 18, 11, 
Uh, let me quickly read verses uh, 11 to uh, 14. As we see a parable yet again that the Lord is teaching us here. Uh, the Lord teaches us a parable, and it's a parable of the wandering sheep. Take it that, that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. If at any point in time we need a scriptural evidence, this is for why children um, would, um, well, whether or not they are guardian angels for little ones, the Lord has provided us that basis here. You know, he's talking about, you know, little, uh, little children, and he says that in heaven, they are angels. That means they do have guardian angels. The angels that have been assigned to, uh, children, you know, children of believers, I believe, right from infanthood, and uh, they behold the face of the Father on behalf of these children. They take instructions on uh, from the Father, you know, on their behalf, on the behalf of these children, to protect them, to shield them, to accompany them, you know, and to you know just minister generally. The way uh, we have uh, angelic. Uh, uh, as uh, ministration, you know, uh, the way we have angelic beings assigned to us, uh, because Hebrews chapter one says, uh, they're not all ministering spirits, referring to angels. They were sent uh, to minister to those who have the years of salvation. So everyone of us who is uh, here of salvation, everyone of us who is born again as adults now, we have uh, angelic beings that are also assigned to us to minister, you know, uh, uh, on our behalf. They're, they're designed and delegated by God to minister on our behalf. So the same privilege, I believe, is also extended to the little ones, as Jesus has confirmed in verse, in the verse that I just read in verse 10. And then in verse 11, for the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. Every now and then we see Jesus emphasizing his mission part of the reason why he came, which is that he's come uh, to save that which was lost. Uh, and then in verse 2, I say, I think he, if a man have an hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he finds it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiced more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so, it is not the will of your father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. And uh, like I said, even though the Lord used, is using an imagery of a, a child, you know, to teach or to instruct the disciples on the vital you know, issue of humility and all that. Also, it should not be restricted just to little children. So when he's saying little child too, it's also, I believe, a picture of the disciples. You know, um, it's also a because he's, he's teaching disciples and instructing them using a little child. You know, and then he's telling them, look, as disciples, you also must become as, you know, as, as little children. So this is that also I can believe to disciples. So the Lord is saying here that if you know um, one of the sheep, and we know that sheep in scripture is always a picture of uh, the saved, the saved, the, the believers. Um, I, I, originally it was a picture of, of the Jewish uh, people, why goats typify, goats will normally typify the Gentile nations, the Gentile nations and the non-Jewish nations, why the sheep would defy the Jew. But by extension also, but in the New Testament, you know, when the Lord says, my sheep hear my voice, you cannot really just say, that's referring to just the Jewish nation. I believe that's referring to totality of those who are in the kingdom of God, you know, whether as uh, believing Jews or uh, as Gentiles as well, the sheep. So here, when the Lord is using that uh, uh, Im imagery of a uh, sheep going astray, 
I believe he's talking about maybe, you know, a Christian who backslide, a Christian who backslide, who's gone astray, you know, and then, but uh, the Lord does not give up on a believer who draws back, you know, his soul does not take a delight in a believer drawing back, but he doesn't give up. There is uh, the, the love of, that Christ has for, for us and for every believer compels him. Uh, if there's anything that the love of God does, I think the love of God is compelling. That's what I've seen. And the Lord also expects our love also to be compelling. That's why there's a scripture that says that the love of, of, of God compels us. So it, that's what God's love that it compels. So, so, so even as a, as a good shepherd that the Lord Jesus is, you know, if one of the sheep should go astray, what it does is that it leaves the 99 and it goes into the mountains, a high place, you know. It, 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 that takes effort. It takes effort. That's the, that's what the love compares him. And then, you know, at the risk of himself, you know, getting injured, getting hurt, uh, tripping over as he's, you know, the shepherd is trying to climb, whatever, whatever risk or danger the, the shepherd is exposed to, it does not matter, regardless of the danger that he is exposed to. He climbs up the mountain in search. Bible says, and he seeketh that which is gone astray. It does not matter how long it's going to take, you know. So, so I believe in this parable, the Lord is trying to show us the extent to which he himself, you know, being the shepherd of the sheep, the extent to which he himself would go, and the extent to which he has actually gone when he went to Calvary, you know, that to save that which is lost. You know, I think that's the message the Lord is trying to pa uh, pass across here. So God's love for us, brethren, is extravagant. It's extravagant. That's the way I would describe it. And we see that love also in another parable, you know, the parable of the prodigal son, you know, the one who of his own volition took all of his inheritance and he went into his own land. And he began to live a licentious lifestyle. And when he ran down and became in need, he came back home. You see how the father did not really wait, you know, for him to get into the house. You know, he was expectant. He was expectant. He probably had, had been waiting at the door or looking through the window for a long time. Because as soon as he saw the sun coming from afar, he ran out of the house and he ran after, uh, you know, uh, run, run towards him. You know, and he didn't wait for him to, you know, explain. He didn't wait for him to even ask for forgiveness for the wrong he's done. The father, you know, uh, forgave him, embraced him, and then, of course, you know, that I killed this uh, fattest uh, uh, cow, you know, uh, to make merriment and celebration. So, so, that is, that, that, so that's the aspect, that's the nature of, of Christ. That's the nature of Christ, you know. Uh, that's the nature of the love of God, you know, which is very extravagant, which is very unrelenting, which, which, which can overwhelm us, which, uh, you know, uh, is... Uh, it, it, very wonderful. And uh, for this, I want to read Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse number three. Jeremiah 31, verse three. Say something about the Lord. The, the Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. And uh, that's a wonderful uh, thing to, for us to hear in our mind. God's love is not temporal. God's love is not, uh, you know, conditional. It's everlasting. It doesn't change because which we have changed in our attitude or behavior towards God. God's love does not change. It is ever the same. It's ever green. It is everlasting, it's unconditional. God loves us unconditionally. And he said, with loving kindness, have I drawn thee, have I saved thee. Let's always bear that in mind. No matter what we have done uh, wrong, no matter, you know, uh, struggles we have in our lives, uh, let's always, brethren, come to, to God's loving embrace. You know, let's always come uh, you know, uh, to God's love and embrace. His hands are ever open, you know, to receive us unto himself. I like that song. Obviously, every one of us, I believe we are 
familiar with it, that is a song by Corey Asbury on uh, God's uh, reckless love. Very, very powerful uh, message. And then um, uh, I believe the guy also uses uh, the phrase, he tries to give the meaning. When he talks of reckless love, he says something like, the reckless of God, that he's not saying that God himself is reckless, but that he's saying that uh, the way God loves is in many regards quite so. His love bankrupted heaven for us. You know, the only thing that he had that was, that was uh, most uh, dear to him is his son. And yet he gave, he, he, he gave up his son, which in a sense he meant he was, he, was, he was bankrupt. He gave up the only thing that he had for us. He released it, you know, for us. You know, so his love bankrupted heaven for you and I. His love does not consider himself first. And that is why he came in the likeness of his own son. And uh, he died for us on the cross. His love is so overwhelming. His love is never uh, ending. He does not uh, flinch at the, the danger that he himself, the lover, he himself, the shepherd, is exposed to. He doesn't flinch. He doesn't recoil from harm. He puts himself in harm's way in order to show and to demonstrate his love for us. That's what the love of God uh, can do. And I believe he has, uh, he has demonstrated that more than enough for us at Calvary. I want us to move ahead and then we look at uh, Matthew 18 verses uh, Matthew 18 from verses 15 to 20. Moreover, now the Lord here begins to talk to us too about how the issue of wrongdoing and sin within the body can be dealt with. And I want us to pay attention here because these are some of the things that uh, uh, we don't really see you know, happening in, uh, in, in the body of Christ in our contemporary days. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against you, if he will do a wrong, he will sin against you. Go and tell him his fault be between you and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. So the Lord is telling us, is laying down for us a due process for how you know, conflict can be resolved amongst brethren. You know, uh, uh, and, and of course, we're going to see that he's talking about a local church. You know, in Matthew chapter 16, he made a statement about the church that will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not be able to stand against it. The word church, there is, you know, this is ecclesia, the called out ones, it's an assembly. But it's referring, it's referring to a universal assembly. Is a church universal? You know, it's not referring to a local entity, a local assembly. It's referring to, you know, that spiritual, you know, uh, side of the church that we cannot see, but I exist. And then, but here, you're going to see, it's not talking about a local church, how to resolve conflict or resolve issues amongst believers within a particular local assembly. So he's saying the first step in this process of resolving matters is for a brother to approach another brother. In other words, it's not the case of um, trying to say, okay, let me report what my brother, the wrong my brother has done to me to another brother. No, don't report it first. You know, because in an attempt to report it, then we now begin to gossip about what has happened. Don't raise it as a prayer point. The Lord didn't say that, you know, because that's what some of us do. He's been offended by somebody within the same local church. He said, okay, well, the next time we are praying, I will raise it as a prayer point. Let's pray for a sister so-and-so, you know, because she did this, she did that, you know, so that God will, you know, no, don't raise it. Because in trying to raise it, the motivation is, you know, sometimes it's, Maybe you want, you want people, other people to know. And be, because others now have known, it becomes a, a, a topic for discussion. You know, and then opinions are formed. And then people also begin to pass judgment. The Lord did not encourage us to begin to share its issues with others. You know, at first, the first thing 
you know, he says is, go to him alone, you and, you know, uh, the other brother uh, who has offended you. The one who is making the move to reconcile is the one that has been offended. He is not the guilty party. He's the one that has been offended, you know. So somebody has offended me, maybe has uh, maybe uh, uh, misrepresented a particular thing that I said or a particular thing that I did. Yes, Michelle, within the church, I am the one that will have to approach, make the approach, go to the person and then tell him his fault. I will go to the person and tell him his fault alone, you know. And then he says, if he listens to me, you know, and admits that he's in the wrong, then I would have been able to gain my brother. In other words, that would, that, that's it then. You know, the matter would have been uh, resolved and I would have been able to gain uh, my brother. So that's uh, crucially important. And uh, to, to amplify that, just before I go on, let me read um, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Galatians 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, he's saying the same thing. You know, a man is at fault now. He's done something wrong. Ye which are spiritual, they restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest thou also be tempted. The object, when a brother is overtaken in a fault, you know, our spirituality, we is judged or is assessed by the by the extent to which we go, you know, to restore the brother who is in the fault. We are not spiritual if all we are doing is just you know uh, discussing about the fault. You say you who are spiritual, say restore. If the attempt that you are making is not towards restoring that brother, which Jesus, here yeah, in the verse that we have read in Matthew, Jesus says, you know, say you have gained your brother. When you go and talk with him, you have gained him. That gaining there is restoration. I thought I should mention that because it's very, very important. So our object should be to rest, restore. Because in this day and age where there's social media, what a lot of people do, particularly at the position of leadership of the church, some men of God, they have issues with some other men of God, maybe because of some things they've had, you know, you know, maybe they have had, uh, you know, maybe they preached a certain message or they have acted in a certain way, maybe they've collected, you know, uh, they're abusing their power in the gospel by maybe you know, collecting money from, from their congregation or whatever. And rather than some of these men of God to follow this due process of resolution, go to the individual pastor, you know, and tell him, look, this is what I've had. This is, or this is what I've seen, if you are privy to what is done. And try and get, you see, God is very much a God of uh, order. And he likes judgment to be based on facts. God always, the principle of scriptures is that you don't pass a judgment until you have been able to obtain all of the facts in the matter. That is why God himself, when he was going to, you know, judge uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, what did he say unto Abraham before Abraham began to intercede? Before Abraham began to intercede for Sodom and uh, uh, Gomorrah, the angel of the Lord said unto Abraham, he said, say the cry of the city, the cry of their Sodomy, the cry of their abominations, the, all the ab abominable act. He said, the cry of the city has come into my hearing. But I have also come down to see for myself whether the things that they are doing is in accordance to the cry, the cry that I've heard. I have heard the cry of the city. Now they are seen as actually spoken out loudly against them. And I've heard the cry. But I've also come down to see. God was on a fact-gathering mission. That's why he came in a person. He was on a fact-finding mission. He came in a person to show them himself to see. Let me see with my eyes whether, you know, the cry of uh, sexual immorality and all of the perversion that I've had, whether it is true that they're committing it. And it was when he was going to the city that said, okay, let me pay home, you know, uh, a visit to my friend Abraham. And he told Abraham what, what he was going to do. 
God did not need to come down. He already knew what they were doing. He could have sent judgment directly. Or he could have even spoken to Abraham without going to uh, Sodom. But he was on a fact-finding mission. And he always bases his judgment when we look at two scriptures upon facts. And it must be the same thing. So in resolving issues within local assembly, present is so crucial. Uh, we can also read uh, Leviticus chapter 19, verses 17 to 18, where this idea of uh, faults uh, uh, are mentioned for us in, uh, in scriptures. But let me read on in verse uh, 16. That's Matthew 18, 16. But if you will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So go and confront that brother. If he won't listen to you and uh, it's not repentant, then you cannot look for, uh, you know, maybe some other people or more others in the church. You know, maybe that your elderly people, you know, who are more, uh, more mature, people that is very likely to listen to, elderly people within church, that you know that is very likely to listen to, you know, share the uh, uh, issue with them and take them along with you and then go to him the, you know, uh, uh, the second time. That's the order, that's the process, verse 17. And if you shall neglect to hear them, in other words, this, we are talking about an unrepentant believer. If, if you shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. And by this, it means the leadership of the church. It's not talking about taking a, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a loudspeaker and announcing it, you know, before the whole church and say, ah, Jesus said, tell it to the church. No, the leadership of the church. There must be a question there. You know, uh, the leadership of the church. Say, tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, if you won't listen to the leadership of the church, let him be unto thee an heathen, a heathen man, and a publican, treat him the way you treat an unbeliever. In other words, put him out of fellowship, excommunicate him. That's the standard. In this process of resolving conflict, you don't see Jesus saying that a Christian brother should take another Christian brother to talk. It's not scriptural. If you are in a business with unbelievers as a Christian, you do business right, and you've been swindled, yes, you go to court. But when there is an issue, a wrongdoing, you know, an offense committed amongst Christians, particularly if they are from within the local, the same local assembly, this is Jesus' scriptural prescription on how to resolve it. The issue of Christians taking Christians to uh, unbelievers to judge, you know, it's not, there's no evidence, there's no uh, scriptural backing for it, particularly in the New Testament. If Paul, you know, scolds them, and say, look, don't you know you are, you are going to be judging angels? Why can't you, you will be judging angels, believers. Why can't you judge small matters amongst yourselves? Why aren't you ashamed going before an unbeliever, you know, for matters of faith to be judged? Now, I want to, so, so the, I believe what the Lord is teaching us here is that there is a need for right relationship amongst believers and for right relationships to exist. We need to be able to handle offenses uh, and uh, deal with offenses and mi misunderstanding the appropriate way, which is what this uh, prescription is about. Now, let me also emphasize, because we're going to see the relevance very soon. As members of the body of Christ, every believer is the cell life of the church. Every believer is a cell life of the church. We know that the church is the body of Christ. The church is the body of Christ. And our human body, our natural body, have cells. cells. And the life of our body is in those cells. That's why I said it's cell life. You know, and that's why if a body is going to be healthy, yeah, its cells have to be healthy. The moment that the cells are not healthy, then that is when you know, there's a breakdown in the functioning of the body. And that is, you know, that, that means that there's a disease somewhere, there's an illness somewhere. You know, so it's the same thing within the body of Christ. Every believer there is a cell life. So if our relationships amongst ourselves, you know, if there, if there is acrimony, 
if there is uh, misunderstandings, unsettled misunderstandings, offenses amongst ourselves, it's going to lead to a breakdown in our relationship. And that means that our relationship is unhealthy, you know, and so the blessing of God cannot be there. In fact, all manner of evil work, we will expose ourselves to all manner of evil work, which is what happens when the cells are broken down, all manner of diseases, infections come in. All manner of infections come in, you know, all manner. When, you know, the cells in our human body, when they are, they are, they are, they are not healthy, when they are broke, the body breaks down, and that means that person, you know, uh, is diseased. And that is the reason, I believe, why the Lord is laying down this uh, principle for us. Now, I want us to see verse 18. And as we begin to look at the powerhouse of the believer, there are sources of uh, power that the Lord has made available for us graciously. And I want us to consider them uh, as we look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's the one source of the believer's powerhouse. The Lord has given us authority. And let's take note that um, the initiative here is with us. If you are waiting for God to bind the demon or to bind the work of the enemy in your life, God is not going to do it. You know, it says, uh, whatever you shall bind. So it's you that will initiate the binding. If you will bind it on half, heaven will bind alongside with you. So you initiate the binding of the work of the, of the enemy, you know, in your, your, your own destiny and around your destiny, something the enemy is doing that you don't want, you bind it, you arrest it, you bring an end to it. Psalm says, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end. You exercise your authority over wickedness, and then heaven binds alongside with you, you know. And then if you lose, if you lose, for instance, the work of God in your life, you lose, you know, you release healing where there is uh, sickness. That's the work of God uh, being let loose. You release liberty where there is bondage. That's the work of God being let uh, loose. Everything that is guaranteed for us by redemption, you can lose it, you know, by the authority of the word of God. And when you are doing that, heaven, you know, uh, corroborates. There is a backing of heaven alongside you. But we have to initiate it. So let's take note, brethren, that the Lord has given us kingdom authority. We see this authority first mentioned in Matthew 16, verse 16. After Paul, uh, sorry, after Peter had caught that revelation, the very first time of which Jesus is, said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon that confession, based on revelation, you know, which Jesus refers to as the stone, say, upon this rock, the confession, born out of revelation, I will build my church. The church is built upon uh, our confession of the revelation of Christ, of the person of Christ. Everywhere we went and we confess Christ as our Lord and our Savior, born out of revelation, we are a member of the church. As, as soon as uh, Peter has, has done that, then the Lord gave him the keys. Matthew chapter 16, if you read, you know, I, I believe from verse 16 down, say, you know, I, I give unto you the keys of the kingdom. That was directly given to Peter, because he was the one who gave revelation. But here in my, uh, the second time mentioned in Matthew 18, verse 18, the key is now given to all the disciples, because here the Lord is addressing them jointly. And by extension, the key is also given to us. So this key here, yeah, the key of kingdom authority to unlock the door for God's uh, uh, blessings in our, in our lives, you know, and then to lock it against the works and the operations of the devil also in our lives, to lock, to, to lock it against it, that key is given to every uh, believer. And then moving on to uh, verse 19, we also see an, another irresistible key that the Lord you know, has given us. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, 
it shall be done for them of my father which is in heaven that's a very very powerful key because it's like a blank check it's a key that gives you a blank check say anything if two if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that's a blank check anything once we agree two of us on anything on earth jesus who never lies and who has never told a lie gives us a guarantee which we can take to bank brethren, that it will be done for us by his father that god is committed god's integrity is committed to perform once the condition is met what's the condition two of us if we'll agree as touching anything god's integrity to deliver is committed i find that to be you know very very powerful i promise it's irresistible but the key thing i want us to uh, note brethren here is that the word you know interpreted in kjv king james version as agreement or agree the greek is symphonio symphonio from where the english word symphony is derived symphony so agree or agreement there actually properly interpreted is symphony and symphony is a language of music symphony is a word of music you know where you have an orchestra playing playing where there's symphony means there's no discordant tunes all of the tunes all of the instruments and the all of the notations the notes and the chords and all that everything are harmonized there's harmony of music there's symphony when there's harmony it's not that somebody is going on f f e another person is you know playing maybe his guitar on c and the one who is playing is uh, uh, uh is uh, who is singing is singing uh, C. That's 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 this harmony. So there's an agreement when there's symphony. Symphony indicates harmony. It the, indicates accord, accord. Oh, sorry, concord, concord. I beg your pardon, concord. It means the melding of two spirits in unity. Now, when we interpret that in the, within in a spiritual context, is the melding of two spirits in unity when the two of them are united together in spirit and in mind in the place of prayer they have come together to pray because the lord is saying it within the context of prayer if they will agree as touching anything that they would ask so it's agreement or symphony in prayer but to, to symphonize in prayer means your spirit is one with the person you are praying with your mind is one you are you are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you are thinking the same thing. You are trusting God for the same outcome. You are symphonized. So that's very, very crucial. Because I believe this is the reason for unanswered prayers. Because sometimes this key, particularly when we come together and we pray, you know, corporate prayers, this key, if we don't uh, really understand it and we symphonize, in the same in the same way we are, we are you know we are praying on the same frequency our spirit is one it's not that uh, we are raising a prayer request somebody is praying for the nation that person is praying individual prayer there's no symphony the spirit has to be one they're in accord they're symphonized everybody's on the same plane you know both in the spirit and in the mind and i believe what makes this to happen if you ask me because when you look in the world of uh, uh, music for instance two things are very very important you know because the the language used there is the language of music symphony you know in any uh, uh musical performance you know you've got to have a conductor and then you've also got to have you know what is called a score musical score which you know comprises of the notations you know the arrangement of the music you have them on the paper sheet for instance a musical sheet you know you, sh you show you what the score is, is 
you have all of the notes, you have all the chords and the keys and all of that. They are, they are there and the musical, you know, that sheet. So as as the as those who are playing on the instrument, they look at that musical sheet and then they are playing it. But as they're also playing, see, they also need to, you know, depend as it were on the direction of the conductor. And for us also, when we come to pray in a place of agreement, we need to trust. You see, that unity of the spirit is the work of the Holy Spirit, I believe. You know, is the one who will conduct that, that pray, prayer session. The Holy Spirit does it, is the conductor. So we must trust the conductor, you know, to, to unite our spirit, to bring our spirit together in one place of prayer. That's so crucial, you know. But in addition to that, we also need the uh, musical score of the word of God. Because you see, the, it's the word of God that, really that binds the mind together. The, it is through the work of the Holy Spirit that our spirit will become one. And that is why sometimes, you know, you are praying together. You know, uh, or particularly it's, it's, when we sing, you often find out that you are one in the spirit, you are singing a song. And then just before you change to the uh, a next song, maybe another brother and another sister sing the same song that you intend to sing. You are, part, you are all singing one song, and then maybe you are, you know, person leading the song. And all of a sudden, you are going to pick the next song. And that person raises the same song the same time. That is, uh, that's an evidence that you are one in spirit. That's an evidence that the spirit is the same. And that is the work of the spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the conductor now. That means the conductor is conducting. You know, um, you know uh, uh, the brethren, are, are, they, are, they are synchronized, spiritually speaking. But also, we have to be one mind. And that comes by, by our agreeing with the word of God. By, uh, by having the same mind, you know, concerning God's will about the particular issue we are praying about. And that is why, you know, I say, uh, the Lord has helped me. I don't raise prayer points, you know, as much as life will need my power to do so without the word of God. Because what the word of God does is that it creates a unity of mind. You know, you have seen it in the word. So all of our minds, can now focus and you know upon that scripture, upon that word of God. That's the will of God. It is central. You are praying in accordance to God's will, and our mind. We cannot be one, united in our mind around that promise of the word of God. So it's crucial, you know. And so when that is in place, there is nothing that would that we would ask that the the Father will not do to us, and it makes our prayer. Uh, uh, potent, it makes our prayer irresistible. If you want to pray irresistible prayer, please let's tap into this provision. It's very, very uh, crucial for us. Uh, before I read Psalms uh, 133, um, let me read, let me say um, that, you know, because Lord Jesus is saying here that at least you need two people that are the most natural people that can pray together is husband and wife, husband and wife. And I want to encourage us, I mean, by the grace of God, is what, what you know, uh, we do in our family, my wife and I, having, you know, a day at least together in every week where we come together, sometimes we have to pray. In, in addition to any other prayer, we pray either individually or corporately in the church or whatever. We have to pray together, you know, and it's very crucial. And it is on the basis of this scripture that if two shall agree. And why is that important? First Peter chapter 3, verse 7. First Peter 3, 7. Uh, Peter is trying to uh, uh, say the same thing, uh, basically. First Peter 3, 7. Say, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. What he's saying to husband and wife, be united, become one together. Get to know her. Husband, get to know your wife properly, you know, so that there won't be offenses, so that there won't be misunderstandings. And then when you pray together, on the basis of that, as one, you know, your prayers will, uh, uh, will not uh, be in that. When, when you do that, you know, coming together, your prayers will not be in that. In other words, 
So it's showing that there's a link between the partnership of husband and wife and praying. That's what I say in that. And also, why this is important as a principle of scriptures in Leviticus. I will read only Leviticus 26 because of uh, uh, time. Leviticus 26, verse 8. There's a principle of scriptures which uh, emphasizes the importance of praying together. And five of you shall chase an hundred. And an hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. It's always doubled. Five will chase a hundred, and then hundred will put 10,000 to flight. And your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. You can see the power of partnering, partnership in prayer. It's always, the effect is always multiplied. You know, 10 will chase, five will chase hundred, but the moment they are 10, uh, and hundred actually will put ten thousand to flight, and uh, also Deuteronomy thirty-two, verse twenty. Deuteronomy thirty-two, verse twenty, and he said, "Sorry, verse thirty. Deuteronomy thirty-two, verse thirty says, How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them?" And the Lord had showed them up. It's important, you know, for us brethren to do this. One person, you know, whose prayer is strong will, will chase a thousand demons, for instance. A mighty prayer warrior, as an individual, when he's praying, all he at best he can chase would be a thousand demons. But the moment he joins with another believer, with you know, maybe 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 a prayer partner, for instance, combined effect of their praying together means. Both of them, they will put 10,000 demons. They will, put, they will put it. They will put 10,000 demons to flight. That corroborates the point I am trying to make. And, and, and of course, brethren, in uh, Psalms 1 to 3, verse 1 to 3, I won't open it because of time. You know, there is a place where God commands blessing. It is a place where there is unity, where there is agreement. You know, it talks about... Um, you know, how, how, uh, how, how good and how beautiful it is for brethren to wear together in unity. And then he likens it to the oil, you know, mm -hmm. that is, you know, put upon Aaron's head, that flows down his beard, down to the collar, you know, of his, uh, of his garment. You know, and then he says, for there, for there, that means that in the place of unity, say for there, the Lord has commanded them to bless them. You know, so it's in the place of, uh, of, uh, of unity, when brethren are united together, when they come in agreement, that is when the God's blessing flows. And that blessing is typified by the oil. That blessing that flows in the midst of unity is described for us, or is typified for us by the oil that is flowing from the head, which is the leadership of the church. When there is a unity of leadership among the leaders of the church, the anointing they carry, the blessing they carry, will now begin to flow down to the membership. All of that can happen where there is unity. And then, of course, the Lord also, you know, teaches us another very essential principle in Matthew 18, verse 20. Matthew 18, verse 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, the dear I, am I in the midst of them. There am I in the midst of them. I want us to note that the accurate, a very more accurate rendition there would be, you know, where two or three are gathered together into my name. Or some will even say unto my name. They will gather together into my name, unto my name. Say, God says, there I am in the midst of them. And uh, I want us to also appreciate the fact that it's the Holy Spirit who gathers us. Let's not take it for granted. Now, it is we who gather ourselves, you know, in a particular local assembly. No, it's God who gathers. Psalms, I think, like two says, they that be planted in the house of God, then they will flourish in the courts of our God. So it's God who plants, it's God who gathers. You know, it says, Romans 8 says, as many as are led or are gathered by the Spirit of God, say they are the sons of God. So it's that leading there, is the gathering. It's one who assembles us and it's the work of the Holy Spirit. But then when he assembles us, he assembles us into the name of Jesus. So the basis, brethren, for our gathering is not our denomination. 
It's not uh, whether I'm a Methodist or a Baptist or I'm a Presbyterian. Those are irrelevant. When we are gathering, God doesn't consider those at all. It, it doesn't matter at all to heaven whether we are gathering. But unfortunately, people gather with that mindset, oh, we are Baptists, so we are gathering. We are Methodists, we are gathering, or we are Pentecostals. No, people gather on the basis of doctrine, on the basis of doctrinal beliefs. But it's wrong. Jesus said, when we are assembled by the Holy Spirit, we are assembling into his name. In other words, the name of Jesus must be the focal point around which his people met. That's the principle. We are gathering around his name. The one we are focusing on when we gather is Jesus. It's a person. It's not doctrine. It's not church activity. The one we are gathering around must be Jesus. That is what it means to gather into his name. He is the center of our gathering. So every attention is, is, is focused on him. He is our, our center of attention. He's our center of attraction. That's what it means to gather into his name. And it's so important. There's only one center into which we're entitled to come together. And that is into the name of Jesus. And it is when we gather in this way, or when we are gathered by the Holy Spirit, into his name in this way, Jesus being the focal point of our gathering, that is when he will be in the midst of us. So when you see that a lot of times people say churches they gather, and you can't see the move of God. It's as if God is absent. They are not gathering into his name. You see, something else has preoccupied them. Christ is not in the, at the center. You see, his name is not at the center. They have not put his name at the center of their gathering. If they put him at the center of their gathering, in other words, they, they, they acknowledge him and is the focus of their attention and what is attracting them to gather, he will be there in the midst of them. So even Christ being in the midst is conditional, it's not automatic. As many as are gathered into my name, then I will be in the midst of them. It's conditional. If I'm going to experience the move of Christ in the midst of his church, he must be the focus or the focal point around which his people uh, gather. And there uh, are many scriptures for this. Um, I want to encourage us. We'll read it. Uh, but let me quickly just read uh, 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 one. Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy 12, verses 5 to 6. But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there. Let's take note. The church is not just any place. No. Say, well, I just want to go to church. No. The, the name of the Lord must be there for his people to gather around it. Take one to the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall you seek, and thither shall you come. And thither shall you bring your offerings. So they can't just take their offerings or sacrifices anywhere. It must be the place God chooses and where God put his name there. In the name of the Lord must be in the midst. And your sacrifices and your tithes. Don't put tithes anywhere. And he offerings of your hand and your vows and your free will offerings and the festlings of your herds and of your flocks. Verses 11 to 14. Then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. Thither shall you bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the evil offering of your hand and all of your choice vows, which you shall vow unto the Lord. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God, ye and your sons and your daughters, and your men servant, and your maid servant, and the liver that is within your gate, for as much as you have no part, nor your inheritance with you. Take it to yourself, that thou offer not your burnt offerings in every place that thou seest. God is very emphatic, brothers. God is emphatic, sister. Don't put your burnt offering in every place that you see. Don't put it. There is a place where it must be put, and that's the place he himself has chosen. And that is the place where he has, he has put his name. That's why most of our givings, we, 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 we don't receive it. Because we are not being led by the Spirit to the place 
where we should put them. Say, so take it to yourself. Be careful that you do not offer your bond offerings in every place that you see. Verse 14, but in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of your tribes, there shall thou offer your bond offerings, and there shall thou do all that are commanded. The same principle the Lord also emphasizes. We have time, please. Let's read it in Exodus 20, 24. The same principle. You know, this is the basis for which he told Moses to build the tabernacle. This is the basis for which he told Solomon too, he will build a temple. You remember that, you know, in their wilderness wandering, God picked Shiloh. And he said, the rest is the plant of Shiloh. It is the one who decides the place. Because it is where he chooses that he will put his name there. And I thank God for Jesus, because he also made reference to this in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12. Hebrews 2, verse 12. Hebrews 2, verse number 12, saying, I will declare, this is referring to Jesus, now saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. In the midst of the church, because that is where he himself is going to be. But remember, Jesus said, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. Why? Because it is in his name that we are gathered. And then he says, in the midst of the church will I uh, sing praise to you. So everywhere you see, you know, people gathering in the name of Jesus, or where people are gathered actually by the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, that is where we find Christ being in the midst of them. Because of time, brethren, this is where we're going to stop. Uh, we'll look at the other parable, the parable of the merciful servant, uh, the, the principles the Lord, uh, you know, would want us to learn there on forgiveness uh, uh, the next week. I want us to uh, just uh, uh, pray to the Lord and ask him that the Lord will enable us, particularly for the, the authority that he has given us, you know, to, to begin to exercise kingdom authority, you know, and uh, uh, where there are conditions for us to meet, you know, uh, particularly in the area of agreement, that we'll, we'll, we'll come together in agreement, either with our partners or, you know, for those of us who are praying partners, we will we, we'll synchronize, you know, in our praying, uh, you know, in the name of Jesus Christ. And also, also receive grace to begin to walk, you know, with, with kingdom authority, to begin to demonstrate kingdom authority, you know, and, uh, and to begin to advance God's purposes and God's will on the earth. We need the keys of the kingdom to be able to do that. Father, we want to thank you. We give you glory. We give you praise. We honor you. Worship you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Love for all you have made available for us. Lord Jesus, we appreciate you for your extravagant, reckless love. Lord, we give you praise for the extent to which you went. Lord, so much so that heaven was bankrupt for us. You, you gave up all that you had in order that we might be saved. Father, for that we are grateful. It's not that we loved you. It's because you loved us first. We don't have what it takes to love you. But it is your love for us first. Lord God, that provoked our love for you. And for that, we are grateful. We bless you. We appreciate you. We exalt your name in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for the keys that you have given us. And as we begin to exercise those keys, as we bind on earth, Lord, let heaven bind with us. As we lose on earth, Lord God, let heaven lose with us in Jesus' name. Thank you. We give you honor. We give you worship. Lord, as we also begin to fulfill the condition of being rightly related with our brethren, and coming together in unity of spirit, where there is no discord, where there is no disagreement, where there is no uh, malice and uh, bitterness in our heart, and we we'll pray with singleness of, 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 of heart and unity of the mind, and we agree together with our partners, agree with our friends, you know, pray, prayer partners and all that. Lord, may our prayers begin to deliver tremendous results in the name of Jesus. We thank you. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. And also, Lord, we want to pray for all our local assemblies, our churches. Help us when we gather that we'll make Jesus, we'll make the name of Jesus the focal point around which we meet. It will not be about uh, uh, doctrines. It will not be about church name. It will not be about title. That Jesus and Jesus alone will be our focus of attention every time we gather. And when we do that, we know your presence would always be in the midst of your church. Thank you for answer to our prayers. 
In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Um, do we have any 